believe it or not, there is a live action model for Tinkerbell, and I'm in. I'm Mark Carey. And many, many years ago, I was cast in the role for Tinkerbell, and I did all of her work, I did all of her scenes, and they drew all the pictures for me, and every moment that I had. And so somebody, a nice person, said, let's do a documentary. So here I am on Hollywood Boulevard next to Nikki Stone's show, and that's what we're going to do. Let's go. I just, I look around and think how wonderful Hollywood is and all the places are. And the smokehouse across the street from Warner Brothers is one of the special places. I've been coming here forever. And of course, they're famous for their food. And on top of that, they put us in a booth that right behind me is a poster with George Clooney on it. How good can it get? And I'm delighted that I'm here. And I was asked to do all of this little talking right here in Hollywood's favorite spot. You see, I caused the Depression. I was born in 1929 and everything went right downhill after that, including my mother died. And I was about three and a half. I went to this home of Mr. and Mrs. Rob, and suddenly I was being what was called adopted. They thought I was as cute as a bug, and I could make money during the Depression, which I did. It averaged out about $8.50 a day for being a, an extra or have a line or whatever it is in the movies. And my mother went at it tooth and nail to get me a job. And the first job that I got was in Midsummer Night's Dream from Warner Brothers, which was in a way a terrifying time because when you walked onto the lot at Warner Brothers, they had these huge sounds. I'd never seen a building that big. Most people had This was most unusual. And you would be in the shadows. It would be like walking through canyons. And you came up to this big sound stage, which was a huge building with a small door cut into it, and then a bell that would ring. It would go back and forth. It was like, um, I guess, for a train. And, and I remember Mr. Mr. Plaid Pants, that's what I called him, because he was wearing a knickers and they were plaid. And he was leading us, a group of, I guess maybe 30 kids and their mothers. And he was telling us that when you go in, you have to be very quiet because they're shooting. Well, what does shooting mean to a kid? You know, guns. And so when I stepped inside this building after the bell started, stopped ringing, I was looking around for the dragon because nobody could have to live in that great big dark place except some big animal. That's what they were shooting. So they lined us all up, <clears throat> whatever that meant, and these men walked up and down the line and would point to us. But what did that mean? And my mother was over, you know, looking, fixing her hair, pretending that she wasn't noticed. So I stepped forward and that meant that I was chosen. So the bunch of us that were let off, that our mothers were let off, to go to the costumers. Well, that sounded really exciting to me, and at least it was out of the sound stage. I will never forget this. We walked in, I got to go buy all this beautiful material and all these half-made costumes. It was an exciting place. But the thing was that we walked all the way down to the end and there was this tall, regal-looking woman with scissors hanging over on her wrist with all the, all, all the pins that you had have to fix dresses and so on. And she said to us in this regal way, she said, the bathrooms are over there. We don't want any problems, do we? And we all went. And that's how we started out. And she was very kind. And we were assigned a seamstress. And I was so small, I couldn't get up on the little platform. And the lady was so nice to me. And she's making measurements. And she said, so what is your name, darling? And I got scared because I didn't know which name to use. And I couldn't remember my new name. I just could not. 
And my mother stepped up and said, it's Peggy Robb. And so she said, oh, is that your mother? And I thought for a minute, oh, is that what they want? That's why they want me to call her my mother. Because she's not my mother. I know my mother. I haven't seen my mother for a long time. But, and I said, yes, uh, that, they sort of led me to that. And this lady said kindly as she made a bow for my hair, a blue bow, she said it matched my eyes. And I thought that's so nice. She said, now little Peggy, if you work in this business, you have to be ready to give your name. And of course I started to cry just softly because she had no idea that there was any problem with a last name. And then she said, well, you know, I'm going to write your name in your costume and in your shoes. Well, that was the most exciting thing that I could imagine. So we got out of there and I went, we went marching down the street. Mr. Plaid Pants was taking us. I noticed that Mr. Plaid Pants was taking us the wrong way. He had not turned at this great big huge tree that was in a box, a huge tree that was in a box on wheels. And I finally went up to him and I said, we're going the wrong way, we're going the wrong way. And my mother of course is rushing up figuring, I'm fired, that takes care of that. And he says, <clears throat> what is your name? And like, you know, checking it off on the clipboard was the most important thing. And I said, no, we're going, we should have turned there at the tree. And so we looked around him and realized I was right. As we, we marched off in the right direction, I felt like, well, I passed that test kind of thing. So he said, what is her name? And then of my mother and marked it off and I thought, oh, well, I don't know what's going to happen. But we marched up to the cashier and this was one of the most exciting moments of my life. I didn't know it at the time, but there were two little openings in a wall. Obviously there was a, a room there and you took this pink slip and you handed it to the lady. My mother picked me up and I handed it to the lady. She signed it. She handed it back. We went to the next, um, it was like a teller's window and I handed in the pink slip and they handed me $8.50 into my hand. And we went out and, and my dad was waiting for us. And I held that 50 cents of it all the way home. And that was started the, you travel, you work, you do what you are told and you will get a reward. I made as much as $8.50 a day, 50 cents being transportation. Now this was the depression, and if a workman made $2.50 a day, he thought he was rich. So it gives you a little idea. Well, a little by little, um, it was decided that I had talent for being an actress, and I think my mother always wanted to be on stage herself, so she could give her life to me, to being a Hollywood mother. She worked at it night and day. She was not very good at it, but she certainly tried. And the next thing was that I had to learn how to be a dancer a tap dancer. So I went to Willie Coban, who used to build me up really private lessons, and he would say as I left, Mr. and Mrs. Rob, your Peggy is a dancing fool. And I, it would just make me feel so good, so I would work harder at, at my dancing. So we figured out that it must have been at least eight that I did, if if not more. Even the, the authors of uh, The Little Rascals couldn't figure it out. I was the blur. They would say, run over there and smile. Hit your mark and be quiet. And then run over there and look sad. And I would say, okay, and I'd run over there. It was great fun. It was it was very disciplined. They wanted children who were about four or five or six years old who were going on 32, 33, and 34. We acted like grown-ups. We didn't press any questions. We were told what to do and we did it. The most amazing thing to me was Darla Hood was the star and rightfully so. Oh, what talent that, that young thing had.
and Spanky was there. We didn't see much of Alfalfa. We didn't do many sh uh, scenes with Alfalfa. <clears throat> but the the whole idea was that they got scripts. They actually knew what the short was about. Of course, we never knew. We never knew. We were just told to run over there and sit down or sit down and listen to this teacher or what, whatever it was. And I thought it must be glorious to have a part where you got the script. And I remember the first time I got a script in a, in a movie, I thought I have made it. I have finally got to work. Strange little things like that you did as a kid. So after doing that, they put me on stage plays where I used the name Kathy Carter and um, <clears throat> that was sort of fun. I uh, wasn't old enough to get into the radio, but I kept going. I kept becoming a really, really, really good dancer. Margo continued to work on her dancing. She ended up being an assistant to Nico Charisse, who was always dancing with Sid Charisse, who she said was the most beautiful dancer. She then went on to work with Johnny Boyle as her tap teacher. Then she shifted to Nick Castle's tap dancing school. She found, only found out years later that he was the best in the whole country. Uh, Charlie O'Carn was working on a movie, on an Eddie Cantor movie, and Nick Castle ended up helping with the tap routine. Eddie Cantor did the tap routine on the table. And that's how you could see me on YouTube under Margaret Carey or if you knew Susie doing this great tap dance with my partner on a table. So that's how I became known as a solo dancer. Although I was doing all of this other work at the same time, just before that, I graduated high school on the movie If You Knew Susie with Eddie Cantor. And I look back at my childhood childhood and realized how strange it was, how different it was. Not unhappy, but I go back to the time I thought about we had a social uh, worker who looked after us or then a school teacher that looked after us. And many people didn't know <clears throat> that when you had child actors they could only work three hours a day in front of the camera and only at 20 minutes at a time and you would have to get there early that was not counted you would get on the set with all the makeup and all ready and you would be ushered into this little room it was a little 12 by 12 with grown-up tables grown-up chairs and you might be four years old try to sit on a folding grown-up chair all day long and then you tried to write and the table was up here. You know, you couldn't see what it was. And you had to talk in a whisper all day long. A whisper. And then when the bell rang, and oh, you hated that bell. <clears throat> they were going for a take. The teacher would go, and you may not speak all that time. It may take them five, six, seven minutes to do the scene over and over again to get what they wanted. Do you know what it does to a kid not being able to talk for five or six minutes? It, it you know, or you, you had, <laughs> I want to go to the bathroom or whatever. You didn't move. And then you had learned your lines the night before, if indeed you had lines. And you were, you, on the way there, you were saying your lines over and over and over and over again. And then the AD, the assistant director, would come and get you, and the social worker would put down the time. You were allowed to walk out of there. You could work 20 minutes in front of the camera. You're just praying that nobody changed the lines. And of course, the adult actors had been working on the scene for the last 10 minutes, and you walk in. And it's like you bump into people and all the rest. It always takes that much longer with kids, but from the kids' point of view, it's either I don't care, they, they hired me, you know, and they'll just have to put up with it, or in my case it was, oh, did I do something wrong? Oh, did, I didn't come to, oh, uh, and my mother said I didn't smile enough, or whatever it was. And then you went home and you learned your lines for the next day. 
or you went to a dancing class, or you did your homework and you went to bed. No fun with anybody else. As a matter of fact, we had a very famous uh, child star at MGM when I was in their schoolroom. And he got a hold of a ball, and he was, he was batting the ball uh, next to the schoolroom, and he got reprimanded, really. You can't play here. You don't play there. And that's why so often I thought that we, these, these kids got a reputation of being hard to deal with. I could understand. I mean, it was either you shut your mouth and you, you listen intently to what anybody said. My problem was, of course, I had this face blindness, and I would go back on the stage and wait for somebody to come up to me to tell me, because I couldn't remember who the AD was or recognize the director. So all of this was very, very, very confining. When I broke out, so to speak, when I was 18, I loved to drive. I loved to go every place. I loved to have people around me. I loved to see what what was around the corner. And a lot of that is what I brought to Tinkerbell. What's around the next corner? Right about that time, I it's not clear in my mind. I know I went to work for 20th Century Fox after I was doing the Ruggles show, but somewhere along in there, I also did my, one of my favorite episodes of The Lone Ranger. I watched westerns like most people watch rock and roll with the younger folk. They were my heroes. The Lone Ranger was my hero from the time I was 11 years old and he went on the air. I dreamed about the Lone Ranger saving my life. I would dream up these things and he would always come and snatch me uh, uh, and, and save me at the last minute. Well, suddenly I'm going to play Jane Carter on the Lone Ranger. The other thing that is pretty funny is that when we sent in all of our information that went into the uh, directory for Screen Directors Guild, we all lied. All of us lied. We said we could swim. We said we could we could ride. We said we could uh, roller skate. We said we, we just lied. And when they called me and said, I said, well, I would love to do it, except I really have to tell you, <laughs> I don't ride. And they said, hmm, okay, we'll just let you dismount. <laughs> You'll see me dismount beautifully in this episode. And I worked with Clayton Moore, and I worked with Jay Silverheels in it. I really can't remember the name of the villain, but the villain, but wonderful actor. And what I want to say about that is that Clayton Moore is such a gentleman, and Jay Silverheels is such a gentleman that they protected me on that on that shoot. Now you don't think about it, but it is very, very, very difficult to turn out one show a week for television. Put the music to it, do the editing, get it okayed. I mean it's just really difficult. So we were in one sound stage with a very low ceiling over in the main part of town, an old one, and they had five sets on the set. We did, we did no location. That's, they always say, oh, that's going to take time. So the horses were on the, the set and, and all the rest. Well, so was the crew. And the crew were all old timers, all big old guys that worked with each other for 30 years. And they can use four letter words like you can't believe. But every time that we broke to relight and go to another set, every time, Clayton Moore and Jay Silverheels would call me over and we would sit over on the sidelines and they would ask me questions about my career and then I could ask them questions and I suddenly realized what they were doing but they were protecting me from all that was going on the hullabaloo that was going on in the other day. I thought wow that's my lone ranger that's my hero <laughs> so I and I got to say <clears throat> the last line, which is, 
No, Dad. He's the Lone Ranger. Highlight of my career. <laughs> I also did the Andy Griffith Show. And I am in the most famous episode, I get put in jail. I'm one of the seven married couples on the show. All the rest of the people are not married. I don't know if any of you ever noticed, but they're not. And that's how we got along so well, I guess. But anyway, it was the, it's the Christmas show. And uh, my husband is put in jail at the insistence of old Ben Weaver because my husband is moonshining on Christmas Eve. And of course, uh, Barney and, and Sheriff Taylor are all upset that they have to do this. But they go out and pick up the wife and the two kids, that's me, and they bring us back to the jail and they put us in jail and then they bring the Christmas uh, presents and the food and everything to the jail office itself. And old Ben Weaver finally gets himself uh, put in jail himself and gives out presents from his emporium. The next one was Andy forecloses. Now, uh, that was one where Ben Weaver wants to kick us out of our house. And I had a much bigger part in that. And it was lovely working on the show. <clears throat> I have found in working those shows that they could be either one or the other. If you have a core group, when you bring in someone from the outside to do uh, other parts in the, sh in the show, either you can be included or excluded from the core group. Not in any way, shape, or form in a mean fashion. It's just the way that they do it. <clears throat> and in this one you were included you became part of the family with with it was it was quite wonderful and Don Knotts was adorable uh, I had no scenes with Opie on the second one and the first one I did he was as cute as a bug uh, so I now travel for the Andy Griffith show and one of the reasons is I'm 90 years old and you know Betty Lynn is still alive she's up at Mount Airy which is Andy's birthplace up in North Carolina and we go about the third weekend in September and we change Mount Airy into Mayberry. We have tribute artists, we entertain, I'm in a parade, and Betty Lynn is there signing autographs along with us. Ronnie Shell is there. He had one line in one show, but he went on to be in uh, Gomer Pyle. So he did a lot of that. So they love us and we love them. Now, it's very near and dear to my heart because a certain person that we're going to talk about later drove all the way from Hilton Head Island in South Carolina to meet me up in Mount Airy and it was love at second sight. We'll tell you that story later. One of my favorite people and I was so glad that she was chosen as one of the top comedians of television and that's Betty White. And she sort of changed my persona and I give her credit for getting a lot of jobs because I sort of followed what she did. I was about 17, 16, 17, and I was a host of the show on Channel 13 here in Los Angeles with Al Burton, who went on to do uh, to produce Charles in Charge and all of those different wonderful shows. And the show was that we went out, it was called Teleteen Reporter, we went out to high schools and found talented folk and we put them on TV and I did two or three numbers singing, singing, and dancing and, and Al was, we were supposed to be the school's reporters and we were making the newspaper for the next day. Well, at the next little sound stage they had at Channel 13, there was uh, there were shows going on. One day I peeked in, and here was one of my favorite people, Al Jarvis, and the make-believe ballroom Al Jarvis. I say that because he was on the air on radio, and actually they were playing records on television. I mean, we were desperate for the ideas for television, and there was a young lady there called Betty White, 
and I stood in the, in the shadows and watched her. She was a cut up. She would come back with sassy sayings and she was absolutely adorable. And I was being the sweet young thing on my show. And I thought, no sirree, Bob, if she can do it, so can I. So the next show that I did on our show, uh, I, I gave a flip answer. I didn't stick with the script. I gave a flip answer, and Al looked at me, and I looked at him, and bless his heart, he went with me. And we became the same kind of banter that you see right now uh, on television. So I keep thinking of Betty White, and I, see, I, I flip out things, and I'm sure Betty would have said it, and I thought, I think she's a genius, and I think she's a wonderful woman, and I think a little bit of Tinkerbell in there. When I was working um, as Tinkerbell and being the live action model, I got this wonderful call from Mark Davis who said, how would you like to be the live action model for the red-headed mermaid in the, in the lagoon sequence? I said, would I? I will be right there, Mr. Davis. So the first thing that you do when you do any kind of animation is you start out with the track. You record it. They called us in to record at 1.30 in the afternoon, uh, including June Ferre, who of course is the famous voiceover actress of Rocky for Rocky and Bullwinkle and so many other things, and Connie Hilton and me. And we did our thing, and in fact, I'm the one that says, we just wanted to drown her. And so I thought, this is neat, because I was reading a script. We stepped outside, and all three of us looked at each other and said, why are we worried about being in front of the camera? Let's go into voiceover acting. Of course, June was already doing radio. So I sort of went in that direction, and I have had just a blast. I've done over 600 cartoons, and one of the, the series was The New Three Stooges. We did 139 episodes, Dear, Dear Men, and we had 11 live openings and closings that went with each little cartoon that for Saturday morning. Uh, I didn't know what to expect because I have never really been crazy about the Three Stooges and the way that they slap each other around and so on. I think it's more of a guy thing. I don't know. But they were so professional. That's what really got me. But Mrs. Fine and Mrs. Howard ran the whole thing. Yes, they would come in and sit down in chairs next, wherever if we were shooting live, if we were recording and they would start talking to each other quietly as if they hadn't seen each other in five years. And if Mrs. Howard thought it was taking longer than it should, she would go and say, Oh, Mo, darling, Mo. And he would say, What is it, sweetheart? She said, It's getting late. And she would look at her wristwatch. He'd say, Okay. And she would move us along. We had fun on the set. They were, as I say, dear people. And one time we were doing a scene where Mo was supposed to pull electrical wire out uh, down by the carpet. And he was crawling on his knees and, and, he, and he's supposed to pull it because on the other side of the wall was going to be a telephone that was pulled or something. I don't remember what. And he's doing his lines and he goes and he grabs it and he finishes a funny line, whatever it is. And we say, okay, cut. Turns around, his hands are all bloody. It, it, it had been snugged up against the wall too tight. And for him to get in touch, he got nails and, it, you know, scratched his head. But they finished the shot. That was the whole thing. You always finish the shot. So professional. Another time, we were down at the Balboa Bay Club in Newport Beach doing these live openings that we have for the cartoons. This one, I am Mrs. Highfalutin and my husband is Highfalutin and we are sitting there ready to be served by, guess who, the Three Stooges. Well, one gets the pie in the face, one gets, you know, that you can imagine. The interesting part was this famous bit where Emil Sitka, who was playing Highfalutin, stands up and he slaps Curly Joe. 
which he's supposed to do. And he gave him such a hit that you could see the marks on on uh, Curly Joe's face. And Curly Joe is hot. And he says, no, wait a minute, buddy. And then Mo stepped right in front and gets it going again and then steps back just as highfalutin hits him again. So highfalutin, my husband, picks up a plate from the table to hit him over the head with it and he picked up a real plate, not a breakaway plate. And you will hear me say, here, sweetie, try this one. And he was going to hit him over the head with a regular plate. But we went right on. We finished the scene. That was the whole thing. Get it in the camera. Get it done. And when they finished, uh, Curly Joe is holding his, his cheek. I mean, it's bright red. Because Emil went out of his mind with, you know, hitting him. But that's who they were. Amazing professionals. And very dear people. Yes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about all of the voices you've done. Give us a little taste of your favorites. Oh, well, 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 I'm in a Scots place, you know. And I like to talk that way because I think of Scots. Well, I know I am. And then there's, of course, the Irish. The Irish is a is a wonderful way, soft, lovely, much softer than the Scots. Uh, maybe you remember a fellow named Hal Smith. And Hal Smith was Otis Campbell, the drunk on the Andy Griffith Show. Well, Hal and I were dear friends, or the family were, families were dear friends, way back when I was 18 years old. And he came on as the announcer on the Charlie Ruggles Show, that we did. Anyway, I ended up with Hal on several things. Hal and I, because we're, he was not much taller than I, had the same microphone. I said to him one day, Hal, I'm supposed to do a German accent here. I don't know how to do a German accent. He says, you don't know how to do a German accent. Well, I will take you over here to the side and give you a sentence. And I said, I need a sentence for a German accent. He says, yeah. My sentence before I do a Truman accent is, she was looking out the window when I saw her. I said, yeah. And I went back and I did a German accent. That's the way we learn them. So we're standing right outside the Tama Center here in Atwater Village. Once the home of Walt Disney himself, we used to have lunch here every single day. Come on inside, let's go take a look around. So originally we were built in 1922. We've done a few renovations since, but it still retains that old character and old charm that it had in 1922. I want to stop and pause here. Just as we enter the restaurant, we have two of our most important Disney artifacts hanging on the walls. Um, we've got one over here. Uh, which was done for our 75th anniversary. Both of our founders, uh, well, the second generation of the family and the third generation of the family, here holding a piece of prime rib with all the Mickeys down below. It's just such a whimsical, beautiful piece that we were given by uh, the Imagineering team. And then over here around our Christmas tree, we can sneak in around the tree. I've got uh, a Jim Hench animation. And Jim was one of the uh, most prolific uh, Disney animators and he did this for us and this was in 1958 and in the middle there is Lawrence Frank. Lawrence Frank was the founder of the restaurant along with his brother-in-law Walter Vandekamp and Lawrence and Walt were great friends. So next I kind of want to show you where Walt Disney spent his days here. Follow me. So as we walk through the restaurant we can see the old Scottish architecture. And Walt actually had a, a big part in designing this building. Not himself, but he actually introduced us to the person who designed it. And that was uh, one Mr. Harry Oliver. He was a famous set designer uh, for the studios and for Walt Disney. And what he did was, he, uh, he took our owner's vision. The owner's vision was, I want to create a Scottish country manor here in Los Angeles. And Harry Oliver says, that, absolutely, I'll do all the plans for you. And the guys showed up with their work crews, and, he, and Harry laid out the plans for him. He said, all right, guys, put away the rulers, put away the levels, and do everything by hand. So nothing had a straight wall. And still, almost 100 years later, there aren't very many straight walls in this building. I can attest to that. Follow me. 
Let's go see Walt's table. So as we enter this main dining room, this is one of the most original parts of the restaurant. This was here in uh, the 30s when Walt used to come. And as we know, we've got Walt Disney's table over here, the famous Table 31. So he would take his meetings back here in the afternoon and he'd have lunch. And the animators, they used to hang out here because they knew Walt was gonna be in the back. He would have a few meetings in the morning, he'd have his lunch. And sometime in the afternoon, the animators might be able to get something in front of him. So they would wait around and in the afternoon, they'd all come running over with their ideas and their sketches. And they were working on one particular project. They were working on Snow White. If you match Snow White's house with our uh, actual building back then, they're the exact copy. You can put them one over the other. It looks like they stenciled the picture and made Snow White's house with it. It's because the animators were actually outside in the parking lot sketching the building because they needed some inspiration for what her house was going to look like. So here we come to the second room that we ever built into the Tama Shanner. Besides that main room we were just in, this is our Royal Guards room. And it's called the Royal Guards room here because like many things on our walls here, we get a lot of stuff gifted to us. And this happens to be one of a very, very rare, interesting gift that was given to us uh, by actually a friend of the royal family. So what we have here is we have a royal set of arms. So this is the Royal Guard's room. This is the Royal Guard of Scotland pictured here with the Queen. And this set of arms is one of two in existence outside of England. So moving on through our rambling Scottish country manner here, we come to the last big renovation that we ever did to the Tamashanner, but it was done in that Hollywood style. And the Hollywood style is, this is essentially a movie set up here itself. Uh, unfortunately, at the time we built this, Harry Oliver had since retired, but we did contract a whole group of studio set designers to design this room to make it look like the rest of the restaurant. We actually feel like we're in the same restaurant. It doesn't feel different. We're actually in a different building. We're in the neighbor's building next door that we just walked up those steps into. But all of this that was done was all done by set designers. So all of these beams that you see in here, they're actually all made out of fiberglass, not wood at all, but no one would ever know. That's the beauty of Hollywood and the magic that this place is. Well, we're sitting here today at Walt Disney's table. Let's take it away, Margaret. Oh, thank you, kind of nice introduction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I was uh, adopted when I was a little kid, and of course they didn't talk about your former parents or anything then. And for 50 years I wondered who I was. Well, it turns out I found my family and we're Scots-Irish. And the Tam O'Shanter is about as Scottish as you can get. This industry does the most interesting things. So I went over to CBS. My friend met me. I did the segment. I got off. And as I'm standing there in the hallway, this woman comes running down the hallway, obviously worked there, threw her arms around Connie and said, I think I found my birth mother. And off she went. And I said, what was that all about? She said, there was a lady here two weeks ago who was helping people find their birth mother. She goes in the back door. And I said, I'm adopted. She said, I'll get you her name. And that led to me finding my name, my real name, and my family, and my four brothers. I have one brother left. I lost the others and my wonderful aunt, and my family that's Irish and Scottish, which I sort of knew, but I knew who they were. Talk to them, played with them, have a grand time. It means a great deal. My most uh, notorious ancestor is Billy the Kid, and on that note, I'll talk about something else. There's a thing called a hot fudge sundae. And there was a place on the street about two blocks away from Grauman's Chinese on Hollywood Boulevard. It was called C.C. Brown's. And he came up with a recipe for fudge. Everybody would go there. Every movie star would show up there and get a hot fudge sundae at C.C. Brown's. Well, he had to close after a while. I don't know why, but it's no longer there. However, the Tam O'Shanter and the Lowry's food people bought his recipe so I could come here and invite my guests 
and we could have the famous C.C. Brown's Hot French Sunday ah, to die for. Uh, I started in show business when I was four years old. And of course, along the way, I did 37 major motion pictures. And I had just completed working for ABC on a big musical that they were doing. Because you see, I'm a dancer. I'm what they call a solo dancer. I don't dance with the core, the ballet. I'm <laughs> I would destroy it in 20 minutes. So I'm a tap dancer. And I had done quite a bit of the, that at ABC. And I was invited to be assistant dance director at a movie called I'll Get By. One day we're working, we're, we're choreography and so on. And I get a phone call. No, it's not the kind that you carry this way. It's the kind that you pick up this way. And it was my agent. She said, they are looking for a pantomimist, a dancer, and an actress. And I think you fit the bill. And I said, well, you know, I hate to do it because we're right in the middle of this big number. We have 64 dancers and so on. She said, it's at Disney. I said, I'll be there. No question. No question. And that's how everybody felt in, in the business. Work for Disney. It was, I, I mean, it was, it was that magic name. That night, uh, I did set choreography to a 45 record, you know, the one with a big hole in the middle of it. Next morning, I took my little player and the record, and I drove to Disney Studios. I can't tell you. And you know what? The man with the clipboard found my name. That's exciting. That was exciting. And then he told me to drive the car in and I could park there and told me how to get to a fellow named Mark Davis. Well, I was in seventh heaven. So I drove my car, parked perfectly. I got out and then promptly got lost. Had no idea where I was. I was looking for a rehearsal studio. Well, <clears throat> it turned out to be Mark's office because, and here's, here's something that's different about Disney Studios. This wouldn't happen at MGM, at Fox, at Columbia, or, Ar well, maybe Arcale. But anyway, uh, I'm standing there and this gangly guy comes by and he says, you look lost. And I said, well, I'm supposed to be at Mark Davis's office and I'm, I don't see any rehearsal. He says, oh. He's in that building on the top floor. He said, I'll take you. I was dumbfounded that anyone would stop and help me. So anyway, we walked a long time in that funny building. I'm sure that you've all seen a picture of it because it doesn't look like an animation building. It looks like an office building. Up to the third floor, up the elevator, down the hall a little bit. And he says, the door is open over there. That's Mark's office. And that's the first time I knew that his name was spelled M-A-R-C. You know, you meet geniuses in your life. And over at Disney Studios, there are a bunch of them. <laughs> a fellow named Mark Davis. He is a special genius. He is a... You know the word gentleman, you put it all together, but I take it apart. I said, he was a gentle man. And I went into this crowded office. There were two animation desks, you know, with the discs, with the light coming up. You, you see them, I'm sure. And all around the walls were sketches of this adorable creature. And with a little skimpy costume and her hair piled high on her head, <clears throat> and that was the first time that I saw Tinkerbell. I think I told you the story that I took a little 45 record player into his office to play, to do a pantomime of a nine-year-old little boy who was fixing breakfast. Well, I've been in show business now since I was four, and I was about, what, 18 now around it. So I knew I just didn't walk in and say, hi, hire me. He waited and said, what's that for? And it wouldn't work. The player wouldn't work. So there, these two men are standing there trying to fix it, and Mark is trying to figure it out. And then they couldn't find a plug. 
So Mark is down on his hands and knees, plugging it in by the baseboard. Oh, come on. I'm going, is this real? Is this real? And he got up and he sat back and <sighs> ready. You could just tell. So I did my pantomime, and so he was pleased. I could see him smile. Smiling is a good thing at yeah. the audition. So he called up that Jerry Geronimi, who was the Uber director of Peter Pan, along with two others, and said, we want you, Margaret, to pretend that you're landing on a mirror. You remember the nursery scene where she does that, and she looks at herself back and forth, and uh, uh, can you do it? And I said, certainly. You know, I could do anything at that point. And so I I did it, I did the scene, and as I, I played as if she had never seen a mirror before. Now, some people today say that she's preening. I did not do it that way. I did it like, oh my goodness, there's a, oh, oh, that's wonderful. And then, you know, how beautiful my wings are. And then, of course, they wanted me to do that my hips were too big. And so as I marched off. And it was either right then or next week, I can't remember, but the magic words of, would it be convenient for you to come to work next Tuesday? What a lovely way of putting it. Of course, I thought, he's kidding me because I'd never been asked whether it would be convenient to come to work before, but he called me himself. And that's how I got the job. Okay, and what was your first day on the job like? Uh, the, the mirror scene. It, you did the mirror scene again. I did. Well, I did it in front of a 35 millimeter camera on stage one uh, with a full crew, 12 guys, and all the lights and a uh, full camera crew. Mark Davis was sitting there with sketches of the things that they wanted Tinkerbell to do. But the first time that I really stepped out in front of the camera, I said, Mr. Davis, what do you want it to be? Do you want to be dizzy like Betty Boop? Do you want her to be above it all, like Queen of the Fairies? And he said something like, Margaret, we just want her to be you. And I said, gosh golly, I think I can do that. Yeah. So that's how it started. And each time that they had a new scene for her, that they needed to know what Tinkerbell would actually do and how she would actually move and act, they would call me back in and I would be there. They'd do up my hair, they'd wash my hair and do it up, and then I would have my own one-piece bathing suit, and I had a cover-up. We all had cover-ups then. After the first shot, or the first day, uh, they asked me to change over to ballet slippers, which I did, and we just went through nine months doing that. So, and of course, Mark Davis did Mrs. Darling also. And the other thing that I noticed on the set was how he and Walt Disney spoke to each other. Walt Disney would come over and chat and they would be pals. It was just, but Mark Davis would never stand up. He would be talking to Walt, then he would show him this, then he would sketch this. One time, I remember, he showed him one of the sketches that he did because he had said to me, Walt said, I wanted to be grumpy. I said, well, how grumpy? I mean, <laughs> and that genius sketched out something in about 30 seconds and turned it around. And there was Tinkerbell's head looking just as grumpy as he wanted her to be. I thought, I'm talking to a genius. I really am. So I went out and did it. He was happy with what I did. And he always protected me. Walking around in a one-piece bathing suit with all the guys you know, on the crew and the camera people, it's not comfortable if, if you're a young thing and you you feel, I always had a cover up in between, but still it was, he was in charge. I asked um, Catherine Beaumont one time, who did Wendy and, and she did Alice, of course. I said, did you ever, did you feel as protected as I did? because of Mark. She said, absolutely, with her little British accent. She said, I never worried about a thing, and neither did my mother. 
But that was Mark Davis, and he touched so many lives. He also told me that I should do a complete signature when I did it and take my time. He said, those people will have that signature, Margaret Carey, Tinkerbell, for a long time. Do your best. And then he called me up and said, how would you feel about being the live action model for the red-headed mermaid in the lagoon? And I said, I think I could handle that. Something like that. Yeah. So he says, you've got lines in it. So we were um, the, the three, three ladies, Connie Hilton, June Ferre, and myself. We stepped out afterwards and we looked at each other and said, voiceover is the way to go. So that's where we headed off to voiceover. Of course, I'd done radio before. And then I did about, oh, four, five, six hundred cartoons after that. So uh, that was what Mark Davis did for me. And I adored him. How did your relationship um, go with June Foray after this meeting? We became friends every once in a while. She would be going over this way and I would be going over that way. And then somehow we would meet in the middle. June had a, a special booth at the Brown Derby on Vine Street. Now the Brown Derby is set up on one side was sort of a bar, but you could have dinner there. And on the other side was dinner only, although you could order drinks. Well, right in the middle of where it passed, June's table was right there. You passed by. And they gave her her own phone. And she sat underneath a caricature of her that was priceless. And the reason being was she lived way out in Northridge. And she was called by radio stations at a moment's notice to come and do a part that night or whatever it was. So she would take her calls there, unheard of, but she took her calls there. And then she would get ready and she would go get her car and weave in and out of traffic as only June could um, to wherever CBS, NBC, KHJ and do a, a radio show. She was a dear. Um, I'm saying um a lot. She scold me about that. So June and I went to the awards and we did lots of different things together. I think it was Walt Disney who decided that when he hosted the show, the hour show, that Tinkerbell should fly in and then take everyone on an adventure every Sunday. Because when you think about it, it had to be that. I mean, that was fine that Tinkerbell was featured at the park uh, for a long, long time before they could bring some others in, and Jiminy Cricket, but how many people could get to the park? No, it was her appearing each Sunday where everybody was waiting for the adventure, and that's how people fell in love with Tinkerbell because she took them to excitement, she took them to fun, and she gave, sometimes, Walt Disney, a bad time. She, she really did. And I'm very, very cognizant of the idea that all of those things had to line up for Tinkerbell to be the icon that she is, and the fact that I was cast in the role and did all of her acting with dance movements and all of the things. I, I, you know, it's like that wonderful phrase, how good can it get? And don't you think I haven't had fun invited to the wonderful Tam O'Shander to tell stories that I remember from my life and sitting at Walt Disney's table? Ah, can anything be better? I think I asked that question once before. We met Margaret, I think, at Walt's barn about four or five years ago, and um, absolutely amazing. Funny and delightful, full of energy, and I, I admire her because she's always running and always happy and always cheerful. Has an amazing zest for life that you can't. I mean, it's one of those things where you meet her and you're just energized. 
you're laughing, she always has a great story, and she loves you even more if you have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich with her. <laughs> I'm a new friend from Margaret. I had the wonderful opportunity of meeting Margaret with uh, Bella and Christy, uh, and Margaret's just really inspired me ever since the very first moment of sitting down at Smokehouse together and I think watching us talk about some of her wonderful experiences and challenges that she had to face and overcome and thrive in, in growing up as a woman. Uh, through the classic eras of Hollywood. And I just find her wonderfully inspiring, motivating uh, woman to emulate myself after wanting to become a very feisty, strong, brilliant woman uh, who also has a career in her Margaret is a fascinating, proud woman who deserves all the respect in the world. By the way, my mother's name was Grace Mabel Robb. My dad was Frederick Goodrich Robb. Dear people, really dear, but you have to realize that they were old enough to be my grandparents, so they had strict rules, which they loosely took care of. I could get away with this, that, and the other, I will tell you, but one day I turned 18. I was, it was May 11th, and my, my mother walked into my bedroom and said, you are now 18, you may now date, and turned around and walked out. So, I didn't know any boys, I told her, when I went back to her room, and she said, oh, you'll find them, as if that were the worst thing that could ever happen in the whole wide world. So I was working on the movie. I, I graduated while I was doing if, if You Knew Susie. And I asked June Wilson, who was the dance uh, stand-in for Joan Davis. Well, I had struck up a conversation with, June is my problem, how do you find boys? And she said, hmm, you get yourself all dolled up and you drive over to my house and you follow me and I will take you to Hollywood First Presbyterian Church on a Wednesday night for Christian Endeavor. There are boys there. And I said, Zowie, I'll be there. So I duded myself, we used to say the word duded, I duded myself up like Liz Scott with a leather jacket. Oh, I was cool. And I got in my dad's car, which is, it was huge Chrysler Imperial. I went over there, I followed June down three blocks to on Gower, almost to Hollywood Boulevard, and there it sat, Hollywood First Presbyterian Church. Went into the Fellowship Hall, which was sort of down a few steps, and there were about 200 people there, all young folk, and half of them were male. I had found boys. I really don't know what to do with them after I found them, but I had found them. I thought that was really a step forward. And I got to going to Hollywood First Presbyterian Church, and I stayed there for 47 years. Well, after I dated a few times with several, I guess four boys, that's all I ever dated with, well, it seemed like the fellow that I kept seeing every week on ABC's Charlie Ruggles show <clears throat> became my biggest date. Uh, I saw him. I mean, it was, it was not like dating. We were working side by side. And then he would take me out for hot fudge Sundays over to the Pig and Whistle drive-in. That was our big time. And he started courting me. And I thought, well, that's neat. That's what you should do. Somebody in the same business that you're in, because the other three boys were not in show business. It started to become serious. He proposed to me. He asked my dad if it would be all right. And my dad says, okay, another month, another month, another month. And finally, I said, you know, are we ever going to get married? He said, how would you like to elope? I mean, your mom and dad are not well, so, and we can't do a wet, we'll elope. Off we go to Yuma, Arizona. And why he chose Yuma, Arizona was because you didn't have to have a three-day waiting period to sign a marriage license. You could do it right then and there. We rolled up, in we went, and we were married within, what, 30 minutes? 
And we come out and we look at each other and they said, what do we do now? He says, let's see Yuma. So we drove around Yuma and we stopped and had dinner at a place like an IHOP. And then they said, what shall we do now? And I learned that there was a, um, a very interesting movie about birds going to be a documentary. So we went to see that. And what do we do now? He says, well, I guess we have to find a place to stay. I said, okay. And that was my wedding day. All the time that I was dating him, I, we were going to Hollywood First Press for all the fun things and the fun meetings that they had there. And then the special evenings that they had on Thursday nights. So after we were married about three weeks, he said, oh, by the way, uh, I figured I'm not a Christian. We've been going there a year and a half. Never said a word. And I'm thinking, well, what do I do now? Remember, I had no friends. None. I had no one to turn to, to ask about. I said, well, I'm married. You've got to stay married. And um, then he told me a couple of weeks later that women were just a nuisance. And they were there to make men work to give them all the money that, that they needed to do what they did. And they lived much longer, and they drive men into their grave. <laughs> and then I found out that his first wife walked on him. She left him. She left the keys on him. He told me one time. I had never heard this story before. So I'm sort of babe in the woods, but I'm going to prove to him that I am virtuous. I am a Christian woman. I will, And I found after 37 years, he didn't want to hear that. He, he had married me for the, another reason, to prove that women were no blankety blank good. Uh, well, we all know what actresses are like. I mean, my goodness, it was all around every place. And I wasn't. So what do you do there? Um, and I'd always wanted to be married at Hollywood First Press or a church. And this was in October that we got married. And in April, he said to me, uh, you want a church wedding? I'll fix it for you. I said, that's, that's wonderful. He says, you, you've always wanted a church wedding. <laughs> And I said, yes, now I'll get out the list of people. He says, I'll take care of everything. I was so dumb. <laughs> and we drive over to the church in the uh, Henrietta Mears Chapel. <clears throat> there's no park. There's no cars in the parking lot. We walk into the little chapel. They never turn the light on. My pastor is there. Two people that are friends of, of Richard and me are there and they gave me a cantaloupe that was my prize for being there uh, getting married again and we left and he never explained to me 11 years later we were moving from one house across the street on Norton Avenue and I was packing up stuff by myself and I found these legal documents well, when I married him in October, we, he wasn't divorced. So that was Yuma, Arizona. That was the whole thing. And uh, then he could, in April, we could be legally married. Well, on top of that, one of the reasons that he married me was, I found out later, that he got $1,000 from my dad, which is not unusual you know, to cover the costs and so on and so forth. <laughs> he had taken the thousand dollars to get the divorce. <laughs> he, he was brilliant at this, just absolutely brilliant. And I was so dumb. Well, after 11 years, folks, what do you think I did when I found out? I never said a word to him. I said, he's here. He got out of the problem, you know. More power to him, I guess. But this is what he could do. He could figure out seven years ahead where he wanted to be and how he wanted to do it. 
But he could only do one thing at a time, and that's what happened to his business. In the animation business that he went to, because I could do voiceovers, and that he didn't have to pay me, uh, some of them he paid me on, but but basically, and he knew all he knew people in the business. Uh, he would only put up one balloon. In other words, he would only be working on one project. You don't do that in this business. You put up seventeen balloons at the same time, and you hope that one comes through. And they didn't. And that's when I got into the place, and I started flipping houses and. <clears throat> he had many, many reasons to be the guy he was. I knew nothing of them. I'd ask no questions. Here was somebody who said he loved me, who I found out did not know what that meant. And I know that there are many people who are watching this to understand. Um, and I look back and remember <clears throat> when he left me for another woman after 37 years, I was de devastated, as you can imagine. I hadn't been very nice in the last two years of those. I really hadn't, because I didn't think he was doing the things he should. Anyway, it turned out it worked for me, because bless his heart, he came down with a terrible cancer. The lady he was going with, who demanded finally that he married her because he was living with her for two years, he, he didn't see that that was important. She was a nurse. She nursed him through the last two years of his life. I never could have done that. And the reason I bring that up is I was visiting him, and he was prone in bed. He could not sit up because of the cancer, and he said, how could I have been born, Dick Brown, in California, at the beach, lived all my life here, and never have a piece of real estate to live, leave to the kids? And it, then he looked at me and he said, You always said that we were in the real estate business and not the animation business. And I, to my credit, I smiled and I said, yeah, that's, that's about right. And he said, you were right. And now you can say I told you so. And again, to my credit, I said to him, no, I think I'll save I told you so to something important. And he passed away about a month later. This is a very special place for me. I had uh, married Dick Brown and things were going pretty good, but both of my parents were ill. So we had to get a bigger place to move in together. And what possessed me, I don't know, I wanted this big house here. Now, I paid, or we paid, I should say, $22,500 for this house. And we had a $191 a month mortgage. And that was hard, but we did it. And I flipped this house. Nobody used those words then, but I did it all over, and we hit a big snag at the animation business, and we sold it for $39,000, and we used that money to not only buy another house, but to keep the business going. Come with me. So I should tell you that Dick Brown thought of his houses as his castle. I always thought of houses as a financial situation. So how did I get him out of the 141 North Norton that you just saw? I told him I had finished it. I had nothing to do. I needed a new house. And it was right here at 111 North Norton down the street. And well, he bought that. And we bought this house, which we had to jack up the back because there is a stream that runs through that they said that Father Junipero Serra, that founded Los Angeles, uh, camped at it. I don't know what they did, but here I go again. I flipped this house, and we got to the place where we were out of money again. So we sold this house, and we moved to a house across the street. Come with me. And it's this one. And 
this is directly across the street. Well, it really needed help. If you look at it, you will see it's a little more old fashioned. It was built about 25 years before the other houses. So I went to work and started going. And sure enough, we ran into economics again and we sold it. And so we moved up the street. Follow me. I am stopping two houses up from the house I just showed you because this is the house that Jack and I had our wedding at in the beautiful backyard. Dear, dear friends, the Davises, everybody on this block was a friend of everybody else. Isn't that beautiful? I just, well, now I have to quickly show you the next place that we moved to, right up the street. And this is where we ended up. But once again, we ran into money trouble. So we sold this house about $100,000 more than we paid for it. I think the whole thing at the time cost us $189,000. And then we got more for it. And we moved over to another area. But this is my home, really. I loved all the neighbors. We watched kids grow up here. It was such a family place. And we were known as the Norton Knights. And we had a mayor, we had all kinds of fun stuff, the kind that you dream of. So I've had a wonderful life. So follow me to whatever I'm doing next. I mentioned earlier that my husband, Richard Brown, started an animation studio. It was called Cambria Studios. And he had the idea very clever idea that Saturday morning animation had to change. It was all squash cats. I mean, this goes way back in the, or I think the first part of the 60s, if I'm, if I'm correct. <clears throat> and they were blowing up animals and, and he came up with the idea that they needed people. So he and Clark Haas drew up a, a comic strip that was going to, come into an animated show for Saturday morning called Clutch Cargo. And he knew that it had to be in color because everything else was black and white or it was just old cartoons. So how was he going to do this? The most difficult thing and the most expensive thing in, in cartoons are the mouths. Animating the mouths to the track. So how do you do it? Well, he met a wonderful fellow named Ed Gillette. He had designed this wonderful little project where he could take film of people's mouths and project them onto still uh, artwork. I did Spinner. I did Secret Agent X. I did, oh, no, yeah, yeah, you, all, you know, all of the natives, everybody, all the girls. And Spinner, the kid that we never understood why he was wandering around with Clutch all the time. Uh, and we would be bound in a, a wooden chair with a back on it, with our head strapped to the back part so that our head would not move. Our hands were on the arms of the chair. Our script was over here. The camera was in front of us. <clears throat> and we would get white makeup all around here, and then the makeup artist would paint different lips on that went with the character that we were doing. And there was the camera, and we were trying to remember how we did it when we, ran, when we did the track originally, uh, which is what you do about a, a week before you're, you're going to shoot. And we're sitting there, and we're doing all of this, gee, clutch, what are we doing now? So. We had a thing going that we knew we would not be on Saturday morning. We were up against two big outfits uh, that were had the uh, television tied up. So we did uh, deficit financing where we put our money up first. And then you went from station to station to station to station. So we get a contract. Kalispell, Montana. I will never forget that. Oh, bless you, Kalispell, Montana. <laughs> and so we're doing the first. It takes 17 weeks to turn out 
a half hour show with one of these. So we are at the point now that I am going to be, my mouth is going to be photographed. I am pregnant out to here. 1959. I'm expecting any moment. And I'm sitting there, clamped into this. I'm doing my, my work and finishing up. And we finish my job, waiting for the next actor to come over. That was Hal Smith, by the way. And over walks Richard, and he's got his back in between us, and he leans on the arms of the chair, and he says, no, we have to go into production on Monday. He said, um... Now, either you're going to have this baby on Saturday or on Sunday, because you have to be back here on Monday or Tuesday. And he grinned at me because he was putting me on. <laughs> he was. And I said, I'll do my best, Skipper. And he said, at a girl, <laughs> and stepped aside. I had the baby on Saturday morning. <laughs> and now, that, I'm telling you this story for two reasons. One, that I will put up with anything for filming. And two, that I was the best wife that he ever had. Well, here I was, single. And I looked over at the uh, Hollywood Cemetery. And they have this beautiful church over there. It's a replica of the Old North Church. And I love it. And I went over there and would sit and think, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I was working at USC at the time in the medical campus trying to go straight, trying to get out of the entertainment business. It really didn't work very well. But I was there four years. make a long story short, they had a lay reader who read from the Book of Common Prayer. Most beautiful voice and this very handsome man white beard and lovely slicked back white hair and somebody said to him you know we've been meeting here for over a year why don't you sidle up to Margaret and ask her out for a cup of coffee uh, you've lost your wife you don't know what you're doing and get to know her better so as Jack Wilcox also John uh Wilcox. Jack was his nickname, and there was a reason. <laughs> you know that Jack stands for devilman. Anyway, Jack said, uh, I twirled my mustache, fixed my beard, and sidled up to her and said, Hi, how about a cup of coffee? I'd like to get to know you better. We closed Bob's Big Boy that night at 11 o'clock. <laughs> and again, I had found the love of my life. He was just an absolute dear uh, we got along beautifully, and we were married. My Jack was as different from my Richard, my first husband, as day and night. Uh, Jack knew how to love. He knew how to hold hands. He knew how to, to make me happy, and I knew how to make him happy. And after being married to Richard Brown for 37 years, a very, <clears throat> excuse me, after being married to Richard Brown for 37 years, a very um, different man, and he had reasons, but love was not part of his life. And of course, that, that weighs on the children, our three children. But when Jack came into my life, the children said, he taught us love. I had several people tell me that seeing us holding hands as we walked, or Jack and I, whatever, that's the way a marriage is supposed to be. Other people outside of us. Now, I, I have to tell you quickly, nobody said that with Richard Brown. Nobody. Poor dear man. My time here at the radio station was just one of those special God-given times, I tell you. The way that I got the job, or even heard about the job, I'm working at my house, whatever I'm doing, and I get a phone call from my son, Eric. And he says, here's a phone number, call. I said, what are you talking about? He says, here's a phone number, call. They want you to go to work there. I said, 
well, who is this? He said, well, I was listening to KKLA 99.5 FM, a Christian radio station, and they said they were looking for somebody to fill a position. And when they said what the position was that gave the different points, I heard them say, Eric, call your mom and tell her to call. We want her to come to work here. Well, I laughed. He, he, he's such a card. I, but I thought, okay, I'll try it. So I picked up the phone and made the contact. And uh, they gave me an appointment to come over and see them. I think it was in a couple of days. So I thought, this is really weird, but I, what fun. And uh, I went into KKLA. They had just moved into their place here. Uh, it was just one little office. Now it's spread out all over the fifth floor. It's very, very big. It's grown beautifully. But at that time, they had just moved in and uh, they invited me to come in and they would tell me what the job was. And it was a job of reaching out to charitable organizations and matching them up with the advertisers here to the good of both. So they, the charitable organizations could make money buying uh, from our sponsors and the sponsors would give them money to pay for what they were doing. I guess I did well because I entertained them for about an hour and we were laughing. It was the most comfortable uh, interview I had ever had in my life. I hadn't had too many, but this was great. And then I never heard from them. And I knew that they were had a big show and they were inviting uh, maybe 35 clubs and organizations, which would be maybe 150 people to come and I knew it was going to be in November and I knew that there was it was the first Tuesday and I never heard from them. So I thought, well, I guess I didn't get the job. So the <laughs> the weekend before I went to church on the way on a Saturday night, I sat next to this pretty lady. And she says, Oh, I'm so glad to meet you. And I went Great, she said, and I'm so happy to be working with you. I said, you are? She said, yes, I'm KKLA. You're coming to work with, uh, oh, they've told me all about you. Everybody knows that you're coming. And I said, that's interesting because nobody's told me. <laughs> and she said, what? So the next morning, I called in the morning and I said, this lady, who is in your sales department said that I'm supposed to be working with. Oh yes, hasn't anybody called you? Now you gotta remember they had just moved in. So it was a little hectic of who was doing what. And <clears throat> so she said, well, you get yourself right over here. So I came over and oh yes, I had been hired. Everybody knew it but me. And the show was the next day and we gave points to people for how much shopping that they did or answering questions in the show or whatever it was. And here's my best point. I said, oh, I'm okay. I'm okay because they gave me a beautiful office and I, there's a file cabinet there. So they said all the information is in the file cabinet. <laughs> and I went over and opened up the file cabinet, you know, the ones that's at the side all beautiful wood, and there were six files hanging there. Six. The rest was empty, and it says, to be remembered. That was on the file, and I opened it up. Absolutely nothing to tell me what I'm supposed to do. So I go, there's nothing. So the staff was going to come over and help me. I got along so beautifully with everyone that told jokes and stories and all and how this happened and they decided that they loved me and I decided that I loved them. So that was my entrance to KKLA. I'm Dave Dino and I'm the creative director here at KKLA in Los Angeles and my experience with Margaret goes back many many years. She was actually a part of KKLA before I came 
and I had the great delight of meeting her and finding out what she accomplished. Margaret began working kind of part-time in public relations for the station. That evolved into really a more than full-time position of representing the station out in the community, bringing our listeners together with our advertisers, together with community organizations, and she would put on shows every month or two where they would all come together and they would all benefit in one way or another. It was called Points for Profit. And Margaret ran that program for years. It was a great delight to see what she did. And it was also a great delight just to go and to be a part of it as well. As far as getting to know Margaret, Somebody once asked me if she ever got on my nerves. Well, the answer is no. Margaret always brings a smile. She brings a smile to me. She brings a smile to everybody that she meets. Margaret, at one point in my life, provided a sanctuary when I needed it the most. She and her husband were terrific and very, very caring and very understanding in a time of great need in my life, and I will never forget that. I remember that I tried to express my gratitude to Margaret in a way that was suitable, that would fit her and her lifestyle. Margaret makes a big point of, and is very proud of the fact that she does not like to and doesn't really know how to cook. So I bought Margaret a set of cereal bowls. And to this day, she uses those cereal bowls because Margaret can <clears throat> cook cereal in the morning. And it, it was just such a laugh when we did all of these things. And everybody was just enjoying life. And the feeling around here is, um, God is good. <laughs> well, I would like to say, I'm talking about KKLA, was the time that my husband saw me off and thought I was something special. This was my darling, Jack Wilcox. John Wilcox, of course. But his nickname was Jack. And that was a perfect name for him. He came and worked with me on some of the shows that we did with the different um, charity groups, and they fell in love with him. He came over and the station people here fell in love with him. One time, <clears throat> they were having a Christmas show, and I had to fly to Minnesota because I was doing something for Tinkerbell and I was going to miss their Christmas show here. And Phyllis um, Halverson said, she said, well, uh, isn't Jack coming? And I said, well, I have no way. I'm in Minnesota. I can't get him uh, to, to get to the Christmas show. So she said, oh, we'll pick him up. We don't want a Christmas show without Jack. And so one of the guys here went over and picked him up, and he was the life of the party. I mean, that's who they are here. It is just, and he said one time, he had worked in business, in advertising, in magazine advertising and so on. He was a salesperson who traveled and then worked in, the, in New York. And he said, there's something wrong with KKLA. What? He said, you know, I go to that place and I never have to watch my back. Nobody's putting a knife in, nobody's... All the other places I've ever worked, it was always somebody was putting somebody down. He said, I, it makes me uncomfortable. I'm not used to that. And then I gave him a big hug. Well, I have done about 600 cartoons voiceover. That was my business after I finished being the redheaded mermaid in Peter Pan. I thought, voiceover, that's what to do. So I was doing voiceover work when I was here because I had already done radio, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and I had my own radio show here. Uh, it was a little show, but it was fun. It was interviewing called Ministry Loves Company, and I would interview people, and I love finding out about people. So right now um, I have a commercial out there on the air at 90 years of age. 
doing about reverse mortgage. I had found the love of my life. He was just an absolute dear. Uh, we got along beautifully and we were married, happily married. And he decided, as I probably have mentioned before, that he wanted to try his hand, he was retired, at being an actor. Jack could not act his way out of a paper bag. I mean, it was a caricature of an actor. He was back in the 20s, you know, with standing there posing. It was just, he would come to me and I would try and work with him. But he was a salesman. And I showed him how to open Backstage West publication where there are casting calls back there. So he wrote him up himself up this letter that said, I'm a wise looking old guy with um, incredible wisdom and people care about me and I would like to try out for this part. Well, every time that he went for a tryout, he got it. And he got 64 productions in three and a half years. In two productions, he was such a bad actor, but the camera loved him so much <clears throat> that they gave him a part of silent uh, intercuts for the movie. He was brilliant. He got a big job on um, the Adams Family movie. He played the 247-year-old vampire with broken teeth and the costume and the gray around here and the you know the dark around his eyes and the cape and all the rest. And he was on that show for, for four weeks. And he was, <laughs> he was so bad that he was good. Uh, I would pick him up over at Desilu Studio and General Service Studio over in Hollywood each day that he was finished. And he, they allowed him to wear his costume home. And he still had his teeth, and he still had the makeup and the cards. And we had to go over the freeway to get into um, Glendale. And one day, we're driving home, and we come to the top of the freeway where you turn, and there had been an accident. People were out walking around. There were five cars there. Two had been in the accident. Three had stopped to help. And... As we're driving by, I said, oh, Jack, that car, that car is on fire underneath. He won't be able to see it. The owner's leaning on the hood, but he will never. Here, and I don't know why, I had a fire extinguisher in the car. I said, take this fire extinguisher and walk around, hand it to the man, tell him his car is on fire, and I'll pick you up on the other side. So he gets out of the car, cape and all, teeth in, marched up to the man, and the man goes, what? And everybody's going, what? And he said, he said, your car's on fire. The man says, no, it's not. And he got down on his knee, and he says, your car's on fire, And because the flames were coming. And the man goes, my car's on fire. And he hands him this, as dramatic as could be. He almost could have said, my job is done here. <laughs> and he steps into the car, and we drive off. <laughs> I would imagine the conversation around the dining room tables that night, talking to their family until a vampire came up with a fire extinguisher. <laughs> and Jack and I, oh, he told everybody in the family that story. He was a good storyteller. He added a little bit to it here and there. But he was a dear. He was just one of those special people that God brought into my life. Jack kept things from me. He really didn't realize the little things that a wife might like to know. He would always be um, beautifully coiffed, uh, well-dressed. He, he, couldn't, he couldn't wear sloppy clothes. It just was not who he was. And he would get up in the morning and put on his casual clothes with his hair combed back, slicked back, his beautiful white beard. I loved his beard and his mustache. I, I thought nothing of beautiful white hair that he had. Well, when he was ill and I brought him home and he was convalescing, I washed his hair. It was all curly. 
the most beautiful curly hair that you ever saw. I have never forgiven him for that, having natural curly hair. And he said, oh yes, well, I have to keep some secrets, you know. And that was, anyway, that was Jack. You've heard the, the story that where you work is a family. And that is a, that's true of KKLA. Uh, it's part of Salem Communications, it's the flagship. We had the finest general manager in the whole wide world who was like, became like a father to me, particularly when my husband died. Um, tell you a story about my husband, if I may. He had been ill, he had his seventh heart attack. And uh, so they allowed me to work here at night while he was asleep, and then I would go home in the morning, and, and we'd have breakfast together. Then I'd take a nap. That's the way it worked. And this is a, a happy, sad story. But it, it's just, I knew people were there for me. I know that Dave Dino was there for me, and uh, Terry Fay and all the people who were here. So the relationship that I've had with Margaret has been both on a professional basis and on a very personal basis. Margaret and I have become great friends, uh, so much so that I am one of the people that would be contacted in case of an emergency in her life. And I recall one day working here at the station and getting a phone call from Margaret. I went home on December 22nd, 1999, when everybody was talking about, my gosh, are the computers going to work? Uh, they'll change over to zero one. You know, we don't know how anything. It was, and I, I came home and my husband was awake, which was unusual. And he was watching television. As a matter of fact, Glendale Freeway was burning up at the time, so he was watching that. And I saw that he wasn't feeling that well, but I, I said, you know, gave him a big hug. And I fixed him a little breakfast, and, <clears throat> and uh, he was sitting hunched over at the table. And I was working at the stove. No, I was working at the cereal bowl was what I was working on. So. Anyway, I, he finished eating it, and he stood up with his shoulders over like this. He was a, in the war, <clears throat> he was aircraft commander of B-29s. He was my fly guy. And uh, so I said, hey, square those shoulders. He said, what? I said, square those shoulders. I did not marry an old man. I married a fly guy. So he said, all right. Then he put his shoulders back, and he said, I know about you actresses. You just want to take liberties. And I ran over to him and gave him a big hug. And we walked on the hall. And I, he walked into his bedroom, sat down on the bed, reached up to me, and he was gone. And she told me that Jack had just passed away. And she wanted me to come over. I was the first person that she had called, and she wanted me to come over so that I could say goodbye to Jack before he was taken away. We spent an hour or so together. It was a very close time, a very special time. So I called over here. They were right there. Dave Dito was right over. Anything that I needed, anything. And they, they said, you have a job here, and you keep going. He was locked. After that happened, Margaret obviously was alone. And that was a new phase in her life. We tried to make it a point of making sure that Margaret was included in events here at the radio station and that we continued to use her for voiceover work. I have to say that Margaret lives the type. Margaret is the Tinkerbell of Salem LA, KKLA. She always brings joy. She comes around here and she sprinkles her fairy dust of joy. She knows everybody, everybody knows her, 
when you see her, you can't help but smile. And she always gives you a hug. She brings joy at every moment that she drops into. She's terrific, and we love her here. She's a part of the KKLA family. Hi, I'm Linda Swisher, and I first met the wonderful Margaret Carey some 20 years ago at a Disney and a Club Club show. And I was going there simply because my brother was selling this product there. And I happened to glance over and saw this lovely lady signing autographs. And I said, who is that? And they said, oh, that's Margaret Carey. She was the reference model for Tinkerbell in uh, Peter Pan in 1953. And I went, oh my God, are you kidding me? I've loved Peter Pan since I was a little girl. And to actually meet someone who had anything to do with Peter Pan, let alone Tinkerbell, was awesome. For, for me. So I went up to her and she was signing autographs and I said hello and I was seeing what she was selling her autograph for at the time which I thought was way too inexpensive. So I approached her and said hey would you at all be interested in selling some autographs to me and I would represent you and sell autographs to others and she goes oh well here's my card give me a call. And so from then on we started doing some business together but it ended up being so so much more. It brings tears to my eyes because Margaret is so much more than the reference model for Tinkerbell or an actress. She's well read, extremely smart. You could talk to her on any subject, whatever. She's extremely bright and well read, but most of all, she's kind. Yeah. Look at it. You know where we are. Bob Baker, marionettes. I just saw uh, a dog on a string. Yes. But the dog was actually walking uh, with the lady. And, and, yes. and his name is Chili Dog. Yes, but the dog walks and she goes with him. I did, I thought you had to do it. Now look. Oh, see, the dog went. Now look at this. See, now these are real. Now what you have is the strings go up but and then she controls this lady. Do you understand that? Huh? Well, this is the way it works. No, I'm, I'm an engineer. I know how this stuff works. <laughs> this is real. She's not. And the wires go up and makes her move. I, I, I'm sorry. I think Mom is a little confused. I'm younger than you. I'm younger than you. That's true. <laughs> but then everybody is. Oh, oh look at that. Look. I've never seen one up close. Look at, oh, look at the eyes. Look at that. Aren't they marvelous? Oh, my goodness. Look at that. How are you doing there? I like red, too. Yes. Look at my shoes. Oh, we got, look, we got pink shoes, and I got red shoes. Look at that. And I got oh, blue shoes. Oh, that's And the blue shoes. Oh, yeah, well, that's oh, what we get. Well, that's very nice. That's very nice. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. One time uh, we were talking uh, on, on a, over in Burbank and that we had been invited to talk to people. So anyway, Bob had finished his story and I was invited to sit next to him at the table and I told him, I said, I love you. I've always loved you. I love engineers. I love anything that engineers do. I just think that, that the left-hand turn lane that engineers came up with in traffic is the greatest thing that ever happened. And he kept looking at me, and then I told something, another engineer, and he said, well, I hate to disappoint you, but I'm not an engineer. I'm a designer. <laughs> no, that's, that's true, because Walt asked me to do things, and I just kept my mouth shut and kept going. I got all the way past the monorail into more jobs. Somebody said, uh, well, where'd you go to school? And I said, well, uh, I've never been to an engineering school. But the good part is, if I had to pay to go to an engineering school, I wouldn't have had the courage to design everything Walt wanted. <laughs> and the good part is, every time he asked me to do something was different, I got an education and right all the there. things, yes, yeah, so I had to, <clears throat> I did in 45 years, I did 250 projects. You could never get 250 classes in any uh, engineering school and learn nor how to do you, 250 different things. Nor could you pick them out, because there's so much to learn, but you say, which one do I want? This one, you were doing it for Walt Disney. Yes. That was the difference. Yes. Okay. Yeah. It was easy to do. He just said, Bobby, I want you to get started. 
on what we're going to do. On the monorail. And, and, and so I'll get started. <laughs> Yeah, no, he'd do that. He'd walk, no, he'd, he'd, he'd walk, walk away. He'd walk off so you couldn't get a question in. Uh, but guess what? I have a piece of paper and a pencil, and I get to draw it my way. And he never did anything except walk around and watch what I was doing. That note, Monterey didn't have one thing to say. The omnibus, not one thing to say. We just, we just did it. Same way with the fire engine. He said, well, let's do a fire engine. Okay, I know how to do a fire engine. <laughs> and then he like, and then he drove it all the time. So, <clears throat> how did you learn to give good hugs? Good hugs? Yeah. When the ladies are cute, you can't come on, resist. Come on, oh, come on. Oh. See, there's nothing to it. You don't even need engineering school to give give out a very nice, uh, See, particularly I, nice I, lady at Christmas time. I still love you. Okay, so, anyway. Anyway. Yeah, but you're marrying another man next year. This is true. This is true, but I love yeah. you. Okay, <laughs> anyway. All right. Thank you, Margaret. Oh, thank you. I've had a bunch of names. A real bunch of names. Now that I'm going to get married, I have, a, I have another name coming up, but... It started out, my name was Margaret Lorraine McCarty. Then I was adopted and I became Peggy Lorraine Robb. My mother uh, got me into movies, so she changed my name to Peggy Lynch, which was her family name. That's the family up in San Francisco that were the all around the governors and the mayors and so on. That's the Lynch family that she came from. So I was Peggy Lynch, happy as could be. Well, I did an audition where, where I was going to be a, do a big dance number in an RKO movie with Eddie Cantor. And I graduated from, from high school while I was on that. Bobby Driscoll was my brother in the movie. You know, he went on to be in the voice of Peter Pan and some of the acting for it. But anyway, there I was. We're, I guess we're three quarters of the way through the movie. And I'm talking to the star of the movie, this wonderful, wonderful man named Eddie Cantor. Only it wasn't. His real name was, I think, Isidore Iskowitz. And he changed his name to Eddie Cantor as a kid. Um, he also gave the new name to Dinah Shore, who became the great singer. He was talking about names evidently to this, to this actress, and I had never heard of her before, Peggy Woods. Well, it turns out she was a great actress, and she was saying that being called Peggy when she was 60, she didn't like it. So he decided that I should change my name right then and there. I helped him. I'm not fussy. What what 18 year old would love to have a new name, huh? It really worked. So he said, "Do you like your your name, Margaret?" And I never thought about it. I had never written it out that I knew of. And I said, "It's fine, Mr. Cantor." And he said, "Well, why don't we call you Margaret?" And then he said. My favorite actor is named Norman Carey, K-E-R-R-Y. He said, good. So it's Margaret Carey. But when I got married, I was Margaret Carey Brown with a hyphen. And then I lost him, and I was married again to Jack Wilcox with two L's in Wilcox. So Margaret Carey Wilcox. And now... At the age of 90, I'm going to be Margaret Carey Bokey, my beau's name, and I will go into the sunset carrying that name. But remember, a name is all you own in the whole wide world. And the name Margaret, I was always pleased when I took it, and I found out that it means a pearl of great value. And I thought, yeah, that's me. Well, now I have a Disney story, a storybook story to tell you. How can I start? I'm going way, way back when I was dating boys. That was 70 years ago. And there was one boy that I really, really, really liked. 
He was going to USC at the time, and he was near graduation. As a matter of fact, I went with him the day that he graduated USC. I was dumbstruck because I'd never been on a college campus before, and I thought, I don't know what I'm doing here, but he made me feel comfortable, and it was lovely, and we had about six months of off and on dating. And then suddenly I got a call, and I was working at ABC doing the Charlie Ruggles show, and it was a contract that I had to fulfill. It went on for three years. And this nice young man graduated, and went to work for um, an oil company, Mobile Oil. But one of the things that he did at, at the USC that I had, I had heard about fraternities. It's a Masonic fraternity. It's called the Acacia Fraternity. And very nice, very nice place. And one of the things that they did, I think it was at Christmas time, they went out and got some anklets made all for all of the um, people, all of the members, to give to their girlfriends. That was pretty daring in those days to give an anklet. A bracelet? No, an anklet. Well, my fellow wasn't sure that he wanted to do that, but everybody was doing it, so he presented me with that anklet. So keep that in mind as I tell you the rest of the story. So we separated. I became Tinkerbell. He traveled 20 different places in the United States. I didn't know where he was or where I thought of him often because he was just, just a dear. And evidently he thought of me often. Rush forward 70 years. And he is a, a veteran of the war, World War II. And he had friends who said, let's get together a group and let's go over and get a tour. So they flew into Amsterdam. Now I, in the meantime, <clears throat> on May 11th, had my 90th birthday, which I thought was really cool. And I'm going on about my business, but I sort of knew that I had to move. Uh, I, was, uh, I couldn't stay in Glendale. I don't know why I thought that, but I did. And in the meantime, he is over in Amsterdam. That's where they picked up the ship that they were going to all the different ports and places. And he and his group of friends are walking down the street. And he looks over and there is a store that says Tinkerbell's Toys. And he turned around and said to his friends, I've told you I knew Tinkerbell. I've been in love with Tinkerbell all my life. And then he started to talk about Tinkerbell, little old me. Well, one lady there, her name is Sue. She is a go-getter. She said, well, let's get in touch. And she found my website, tinkerbelltalks.com. And sure enough, about a week after my birthday, I get a email forwarded to me. How would I like to get back in touch? with one Robert H. Bokey. And I thought, would I? So when he got back, uh, we called on the telephone and we started talking and we started remembering. And after the first telephone call that we had, I said, goodbye, God bless, hung up. And I walked right over to, I have very little jewelry. I am not a jewelry person. And I walked over. And there is the anklet hanging with my jewelry, with my uh, couple of necklaces that I have. I thought, that's amazing. So I told him about it the next time. And he says, oh, you remember the, the, uh, the fraternity? I said, do I ever? So I said to him, Robert or Bob, I call him either one. <clears throat> he either calls me Peggy or Margaret. We haven't made up our minds yet. I said, I'm going to be up doing the Andy Griffith uh, show, turning Mount Airy, his birthplace, into Mayberry Days in North Carolina. You live in South Carolina, in Hilton Head. Is there any chance of you coming up and meeting me up at Mayberry Days? He said, I have to have my 94th birthday first, and then I'll be up. And he drove eight hours, 
and walked in as we were getting ready for the big dinner and they were setting up the table and he walked in um, and saw me and I saw him and I grabbed his face and I kissed it. We have a picture of it. And then we stood there and it was love at second sight. And right then and there, about three days later, he said, you know where I live is not going to work for you. There's not enough going on there. When he saw me with the people and so on, he said, I'm going to buy you a house. And he did. We get married on St. Valentine's Day, 2020. We have a big party with the Disney Anna Fan Club at the Smoke House. And then he and I go off to Sarasota, Florida and live happily ever after. Is that not a Disney story? He's wonderful. I have had four long days doing this documentary. I have stayed in the same costume so that the editing is easier. I happen to love the costume that works. I have been working with two absolutely fascinating people, one of whom does not know what a period is in a sentence. She knows what a comma is. She knows what a dash is. And three, three ideas all run together, and she's off and running. You have never, I hope you meet her. Her name is Christy Vaca, and she is really wonderfully wild and fun. She wants to do everything for fun, and she does it. And she's bringing up this marvelous daughter whose name is Bella, so talented, amazing. Just amazing. She actually makes Spider-Man outlines in frosting on cake that's delivered to while we're eating dinner. She sits there and she and it's perfect. It's perfect. She has a Spider-Man on her shirt, which she did. She's and she's so talented. She is just going to be one of our really top, top people. And her name is Bella. And her it, oh, she has the same last name, Baco. And then there's Junior, and I hardly ever see him because that man is off and running, looking after people so that they can buy beautiful furniture of Pottery Barn. And he is so handsome, and he just is, he just, he's delighted with his family, I can tell you that. But I want to let you know it's been fatiguing. That means that body-wise, I'm fatigued, but tired? No. They have, I don't know why, yes I do, I think it's because of Tinkerbell. They want to know everything and they want to put it down in this documentary and I, several times through the days I've been thinking, what did I get myself into? And then along would come Christy, come on, spit spot, we have to go over and see Star Wars. And I'm going, oh, okay. <laughs> And I just wanted to let you know, I have had the best time. And then I go into getting moving out of my house and then getting married. It, it, it's like a dream. And these two have been part of it. All right, young lady, what do you want to know? Well, I, and want I will to know, come clean. I want to know what is your favorite word? My favorite word? Mm -hmm. My favorite word is love. What is your least favorite word? My least favorite word, hate. What is your favorite sound? Oh, music. Music, particularly, I like Al Hurt and jazz. <laughs> and I love opera, but oh no, I like swing and I, music. <laughs> what is your least favorite sound? A horn honky. Because <laughs> I've done something wrong then. <laughs> What gets you motivated? Like, what gets you out of bed in the morning? That I'm alive. I'm not joking. I, you know, I wake up and I go, wow, this is great. What's going to happen today? And I tell you, I am annoying. It's a Tinkerbell thing. A Tinkerbell is what's around the corner. Where is the next adventure? I have kind of a naughty question for you now. What is your favorite curse word? Dang. <laughs> you like that one? It surprises everybody. Because it's not really a curse word. Oh, yes, it is. You look it up. No, that's what you say instead of saying the curse word. No, you look it up. <laughs> what profession would you pursue that isn't the one you're currently in? Um, a librarian. I don't know. 
think it'd be a great librarian. Yeah, I would love. I would would have loved to have been a librarian, except I couldn't keep the book straight. <laughs> I am no good at that at all. What's something that you would never do? Like, what what profession would you just? Mm -mm. Mm. Mm. I think a nightclub. A nightclub? Yeah, oh, uh, dancing in a nightclub. Mm -hmm. So, when you die and go to heaven, what do you want St. Peter to say to you when you get there? Enter. That's it? Enter. Because that says that you have done what you're supposed to. Hmm. That one word says you're accepted. That's what. Alrighty. Does that make sense? Yes, it does make sense. Sometimes I do make sense. Sometimes. You, you just never know. <laughs>